You're listening to TIP. On today's episode, I chat with Felipe Mejia to learn about his journey into real estate investing, whether or not you should be buying properties in today's environment, and how to get started as a new investor. Felipe is a seasoned real estate investor, entrepreneur, and co host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Podcast. If you've been listening to this show for some time now, you know that we mostly talk about stock investing and personal finance, as well as a bit of entrepreneurship. But today, we'll be talking about real estate investing with Felipe. If you enjoy this episode about real estate investing and want to learn more, be sure to subscribe to TIP's Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'll put a link to the real estate podcast in the show notes below, or you can go to theinvestorspodcast.com slash real estate. That's theinvestorspodcast.com slash real estate. I also wanted to tell you about a brand new service we've launched here at TIP that I'm super excited about. It's called Real Estate Deal Analysis 101, and it's a live class designed like a mastermind group that takes place twice per month where I teach you how to analyze real estate deals, specifically rental properties and house hacks for single family and small multifamily properties. For those of you who have been with us here at TIP for a while, you know at heart we're value investors who love fundamental analysis, discounted cash flow models, and analyzing companies like Warren Buffett. Now, we're bringing that philosophy to real estate. I spent nearly a decade learning everything I could about stock investing. Then about three years ago, I got introduced to real estate investing, and that opened a whole new world for me. Real estate is an entirely different asset class, and it does have its own specific complexities. But at its core, similar to stock investing, the goal is to buy an undervalued asset at a fair price that provides great returns to us as investors. So in this live course, I'm going to use my experience as a stock and real estate investor to teach you exactly how to analyze and identify those types of deals. This live course is a bit different than other courses you may have taken in the past. You're not given a set of videos, then expected to watch them and teach yourself, nor are you going to sit there and be lectured for hours. There's no specific set lesson plan. This live course is going to be interactive and driven by you. I will explain important metrics and formulas that you need to know, but we'll also be spending a lot of time walking through real life case studies, answering your specific questions, and I'll even be analyzing or providing feedback on the deals you're looking at for your portfolio in real time. By enrolling in this course, you'll also get free access to the exclusive TIP Rental Property Calculator, TIP House Hacking Calculator, the Private Real Estate Deal Analysis Mastermind Community, to connect, learn, and network with like-minded investors. And in the event you can't make it to one of the live classes at the time it's scheduled, you can always check it out afterward as you'll get access to the recordings for all of the live sessions for as long as you're enrolled in the course. Even if you make it to the live session, you can still go back and rewatch the recording if you'd like. If you're interested in learning more or joining the live class, registration is now open at realestatedealanalysis.com. Again, that's realestatedealanalysis.com. Now, without further delay, let's get into today's episode with Felipe Mejia. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode. With me today, I have Felipe Mejia. Welcome to the show, Felipe. Hey, what's up, man? It's a pleasure to be on here. For those who are listening today that aren't yet familiar with you, tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. My background, um, interestingly enough, was not real estate. You know, I wanted to go to college and I was going to be a police officer. Like that was my goal. Like that's what I was going to do. I couldn't wait. You know, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in three years because I was so anxious to get into the police department. That was what I was going to do. So let's backtrack to the beginning, or I'm sorry, the graduating high school. So I graduated high school. My mom gave me a mobile home as a graduation gift. I didn't get a car. I didn't get a ring. I didn't get, you know, 10 grand for college or whatever. You know, my mom gave me what she had. That was a mobile home. So that's kind of how I started real estate without actually knowing. Fast forward, my goal was not real estate. My goal was to be a police officer, establish my career in that. Once I graduated college, put in my application, was super excited to get started. And about three or four days in, I was told verbatim, hey man, sorry, you're not what we're looking for. That's it. 
to this day, I still completely don't understand what went wrong, but I was told like that I didn't make the cut basically super, super destroyed with that. And, um, from there, I, I decided that, that this wasn't going to be for me. I needed to figure something else out. You know, I didn't apply anywhere else. I just said, okay, that's it. I'm going to pivot. I'm not going to waste any more time of this. I mean, I, this was my goal since I was like 18 was to be a police officer. And I was, I got destroyed by, by that. From there, I kind of looked around at what did I have? Um, and that was that mobile home and, and, and all that, that, that was still there. So I decided to flip the mobile home, bought a house. And, you know, kind of the rest is really just history with, with how I started with real estate from there. I saw the power of, of rental income. I saw the power of, of, of flipping one house into a bigger house for more equity and things like that. And that's where I realized like, hey, you know, there's something to this real estate thing. Then I just dug into bigger pockets and every real estate book that I could find out there. And like I said, the rest is history, man. Just been kind of growing since then. You started by investing in yourself and your own business when you started your moving company. And there, but there are a lot of other things that you could have invested in. So why specifically real estate? I mean, you could have just sold the mobile home, gone a traditional route, bought a single family and done what most people do. So why? What really drew you to, to real estate investing? What was that moment that was like, this is what I want to do? I saw the power of real estate investing. So since I had the mobile home, I had never paid a mortgage on my own. It was always either my tenant was paying half or completely or full. And I never wanted to go back to paying my own mortgage and getting comfortable doing that. I wanted it to be uncomfortable for me to have to pay a mortgage. So that's kind of how that happened. From there, the same tenant that I had in the mobile home, I brought with me to my first single family. And still not paying a full mortgage. Like you mentioned, I did have a labor or moving company. I had that was because I was looking for the highest paying job that I could find per hourly basis that I could get with what I had with my degree. And, and unfortunately, most jobs with my degree were paying forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. And I just needed more than that to invest in real estate. I opened up, like I said, the, the labor only moving company, which paid double that and spent all of my time looking into real estate. First, it was just because I didn't want to have to pay my own mortgage. So I wanted to make sure that I always had tenants coming in. And it started a little bit with Airbnb, but then it was like more traditionally renting by the room personally, house hacking, if you will. And from there, it just growing. I said, well, what if I just buy another house and I house hack it to other individuals? And then that just kind of trajectored me into buying more and more properties of this same concept. If someone listening to the show today isn't fully convinced that they want to go into real estate, but they're kind of on the fence, they're considering it, why should they go into real estate? I would say it depends a lot on their goal, but luckily with real estate, it, it hits a lot of targets. So if you're a high income earner and you're paying a large amount in taxes, a real estate or a house or an investment property can be depreciated, right? So that can positively affect your taxes. So if you're, let's say that you're paying 30 grand in taxes, and you know, I don't know what that looks like, but let's say that you buy one single family home that you can depreciate over 27 and a half years, you know, you're able to offset some of those taxes by depreciating your property, which, which is allowed in the tax code. If you're just looking for, you know, another source of income, rental income is great for that, right? So you're able to produce more income. And at the end of it, you're, you're also getting a tenant that's paying down your loan. On top of that, you're also getting cash flow. Also, you know, even on top of that, your house appreciates in value statistically over time. Your house is going to raise in value. So your house is raising in value. Your tenants are paying your loan down. So there's starting to become a gap there of what's called equity and you're getting cash flow. So there's tons of reasons to invest in real estate. I would say take the plunge and just try it out. When I was first getting started in real estate, I thought that I couldn't become an investor because I didn't have the money, network, or expertise to invest. I always thought it was just something for the rich. So what were some of the limiting beliefs that you had when you were just starting out on your real estate journey? And how did you overcome those? Perfect question, man. Honestly, for me, it was a lot of, well, I don't know anyone. I don't have any connections. All I know is framers and drywall guys and electricians and plumbers. And you know, all I know is these blue collar guys. And you know, I don't know anybody that has money. I don't know anybody that's going to lend me money to buy real estate. But when I started, when I started saying those things, to other real estate investors, they, they almost laughed at me because they would say things like, "I would kill to know good plumbers. Like I would do anything to know a good electrician." And I was like, "Oh, interesting. Okay." So buying a, a rental property wasn't as scary anymore because I was able to use and leverage the people that I know around me to help me reach my goals. And and if it's if it's knowing those people around you, so I would say is like, look around. Who is your influence with people? Who's around you? you know, what strengths do they have that they might be able to add value to you as you do real estate? And all of a sudden, real estate doesn't look so big, starts looking smaller because mentally you're starting to have like, oh, you know what? I'm going to use my friend who's a flooring installer in case I need to fix the floors. Or, you know, you start thinking like the real estate's not as big as it really is anymore. You know, it looks a little bit smaller when you start creating a mental team, if you will. 
Yeah, I felt the exact same way as you did. I didn't know anyone. No one in my family had ever even gone to college. No one had ever made any type of investment. I was the first one to ever go to college and even be interested in investing. So for me, it was the same type of thing. I didn't know anyone. I didn't even know any plumbers really or or any blue collar people. I just I didn't really know anyone in the real estate space. My dad was a mechanic, so he could do cars and stuff, yeah. but nothing real estate related. And so for me, right. what really worked was it's that law of the first deal. And you get that first deal done and then you realize that you could do it too, just like everybody else does. And that first deal is not going to like make or break you, man. That, that first deal is more about learning. You learn so much wisdom from that first deal and you overcome things that you never thought you'd have to do. So for any all your listeners, I mean, that first deal is, is going to teach you way more than it's going to make you money, but it's worth it. Those lessons are worth it. And that's a good point. And I, I want to see how you think about this because I hear a lot of people or a lot of quote unquote real estate gurus say that people should go big, go as big as you can on your first deal. And I personally disagree with that. I think people should start small, start with a little deal, get your experience. Because like you said, it's not going to make you rich no matter how big or small the deal is. But I think if you get a big deal and it goes against you because you don't know what you're doing, that could put you in a really big hole and kind of more or less screw you for your future career. So I usually recommend start small, get some wins under your belt, learn, and then go from there. How do you think about that? I actually agree 100%. I think everyone should start small, small single family or a little duplex. And, and you're going you're gonna to run into the same issues that you know a large-scale 50-unit apartment complex is going to run into, except they're going to run into it by 50x, right? You're just going to have one refrigerator go out or one toilet that gets clogged up or one electrical problem that needs to get fixed rather than you know spending all your money on a 10, 20, 30-unit apartment complex. And now you have 20 refrigerators that all of a sudden went out at the same time and you don't know what to do. You know, If you have a single family home, you know how to solve that small issue. And then you're able to explode that into if you do have 10, 20, 30 rentals, you know where to or who to call if a certain situation comes up. So I agree, start small and then just kind of grow from there. You know, Really build a strong foundation. Yeah. And one of my favorite things was that my first property, the mortgage was about 300, 350 a month. And I said, if things right. go completely horrible, as wrong as they could possibly go, I can't find anybody to rent this thing. I can cover that 300 to $400 a month. So I'm not going to get you know completely destroyed from this property. So I said, well, super low risk from that perspective, from the downside. And then I mean, huge upside potential, not because it'll make me a lot of money, but in terms of education. And then you have that one success that you go on from there and grow and grow and grow. That's exactly right. I mean, even with me, when starting with the mobile home, right, I ran into like, oh, the toilet is clogged up. How do you fix that? Or who do you call? Or the door won't close right? Or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I started really small with a mobile home and, it, you know, it still had all the attributes of a home. It had plumbing, electrical, doors, showers, and all that. So, you know, those little problems came up, but they weren't such an emergency as if I would have started with 20 unit apartment complex and 20 doors don't work or 20 toilets didn't work. So I love the concept of starting small and really gaining your knowledge that way. So let's walk through that first deal. How did you find it? How'd you finance it? And what type of property was it? My first actual deal, probably going to be my single family home that I first moved into that I Airbnb, probably going to be my very first you know rental income type of deal. And basically it was just, it was just a single family home. I spoke to a realtor that I was looking that I wanted to be close enough to Nashville, but not have that national traffic and a place where my tenant can come with me. So, you know, the, the famous Victor, the painter is what I call him. And, and basically she just helped me find a home that had three beds, two baths that I knew that I could rent out with somebody else and not be living on top of each other. And that person was going to pay half of my mortgage. So I asked him, you know, like, Hey, what are you comfortable paying? And, you know, Victor would say, well, I'm good with 500 bucks a month. So that I went to my realtor and said, Hey, we can find a house where my mortgage is no more than a thousand bucks. And that makes me feel really comfortable. So that's kind of how we did that. We actually started looking based on what, you know, rents were going to be in that area and acceptable rents were about 1200 bucks. I wanted to rent out the whole house. And if I wanted to rent by the room, 500 bucks would do it. Airbnb seemed pretty good in that area. So that's kind of how we found my first single family. Everyone has a set of expectations before they do something, and including buying their first property. And then reality sets in and it's often different than what we expect. So what did yeah. you learn from doing that first deal that was surprising to you? Surprising from the first deal was that I could do it. And I think that that hits a lot of people different. You know, a lot of the times you're questioning yourself, is this is for you or can you do this or do you have the knowledge to do it? Do you have the grit to do it? And I think once you get that first rental property up and running, it kind of gives you a boost of morale that you need to say, hey, I can do this once. Why can't I do this 10 times, 15 times, right? It's all about fixing your processes and what you're going to do with that property. 
But once you get that first one done, you just get another, you know, boost of energy to go ahead and run into that next property, into that next rental. So I think out of that first one, I learned, I basically was learned and taught myself like, all right, I can do this. I can keep going. I can, I can scale this business. And so what did you do for your next deal? What was, what did that look like? What type of property was it? Interestingly enough, the real next deal for me would have to be the six unit apartment complex that I bought out in Cookville, Tennessee which unfortunately didn't fit my model, but I didn't know that until I established my goal. So at first I was just buying rental properties at cash flow and I just thought cash flow was my goal. But you know, after buying that second rental property, it taught me the lesson of setting your goal and sticking to it and not buying properties outside of the realm of the goal that you have personally. And that's what's gonna, you know, trajectory you closer to your your definition, your personal definition of your successful goal. So as you've continued to scale, how are you funding your deals? Are you using your own cash? Do you have a money partner? Are you doing a different creative strategy? So I have a line of credit on a rental property that we paid off cash. We use that line of credit to purchase properties if they're you know great deals. And then we also do have cash partners that are looking for the same goals that we have regarding time, cash flow, and the type of rental properties we purchase. And then basically I put up half and they put up half and then we're able to meet together and buy rental properties. The way I'm funding it, like I said, is basically we just paid off one rental property cash, got a line of credit, use that line of credit to put down and rehab the property. And then as we grow, we allow the cash flow to either pay back the line of credit or refinance older properties that have more equity. in. And so are you having a hard time doing the fix and refinance strategy right now, given the current environment that we're in? I don't think it's harder. I think it's taking longer. Banks and, and establishments are still doing it. They're just taking a little bit longer and really digging deep into each deal, doing their due diligence more than I think before. I think before it wouldn't take as long as it's taking now. So is it harder? I think it's only harder because it's taking longer. And are you still looking for those types of deals or have you kind of put the brakes on acquiring new properties at this time? Good question. Personally, I'm. if the deal makes sense, then we're going to jump on it. We really don't pivot based on the market. We mostly you know, measure our deals based on what our goal is with that property and if it meets our cash flow criteria. Now, since the market's affecting the purchasability and prices of houses and stuff, you know, it's going to affect our goal, which that's going to determine whether we continue to buy or not, but not necessarily you know, anything else. It's, it's basically specifically of what is our goal for this rental property and does it fit our goals? Does it fit our, our style of investing? And if it does, and if it meets all those criteria, then we'll still continue to purchase. So how are you deciding what types of properties you want to buy? How are you deciding between single family, small multi, large multi, maybe even commercial? Good question. One of the ways that we're deciding is based on our cash flow goal, our cash flow criteria, and if the purchase price makes sense in the area that we specifically know is going to rent well. We we're looking for about five to six hundred dollars in cash flow per door. And as long as it meets that criteria, then it's something that we're willing to pull the trigger on. As well as if it has a, you know, extra dwelling or an ADU or an extra bonus room in the downstairs or something else that we can house hack and add a little bit more value to, then we're definitely still pulling the trigger. We're not buying anything outside of the realm of single family homes that's got extra living space that we can uh, create extra bedrooms in. And you said five hundred to six hundred dollars per door in net cash flow? And you're able to still find those types of deals in this market? All day long. Wow. How are you finding those deals? What strategies are you using? Literally the MLS and we're looking for realtor mistakes. So when a realtor posts a house for 1,400 square feet, but it's got 1,400 square feet downstairs and livable space, then like, for instance, a lot of the homes out here will have three bedrooms, one or two baths upstairs, and a two-car garage and a huge loft downstairs with already plumbing, electric, and sewage downstairs. So we just basically build out bathrooms and a couple rooms. As long as there's windows and we can state a code, then you know we're we're adding value to that property. So now it's twenty six hundred or twenty seven hundred square feet of livable space. And so basically, that space down there is just like an unfinished basement that has all of the necessities needed. It just isn't finished yet. That's exactly right. We find them unfinished, and realtors will sell them at fourteen hundred square feet for for the house. We know that these houses have more like twenty six, twenty seven hundred square feet of livable space. And is this something you think that people can do all across the US? Oh, 100%. I mean, you can find houses like this anywhere with the, you know, if you can find a house that's got an extra garage, but the key is to make sure it's got the electrical and the plumbing already ran downstairs because that's what's really going to cost you some money. But if it's already set that way, then you should be good. So, yeah, you can do that anywhere. I mean, as long as you have 
one, one of the ways that we figured out is, is we just asked the listing agent, hey, does it have washer and dryer hookup downstairs? And to me, that says that there's water, electrical, and sewage downstairs because the washer and dryer are downstairs. And basically, I just take out the washer and dryer and create a bathroom downstairs. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do you identify these properties quickly? But it sounds like that's a really good way. You don't, you don't even have to go to the property necessarily. You could just send an email and say, hey, are these things set up in the basement? And then that kind of lets you know. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly how we do it. So when you offer these deals, you're looking at it as the purchase price, then you're adding in the construction costs and then including the new rents. You're not running the numbers at what it would be currently, correct? And how can you make sure that as a new investor, because we mostly have new investors listening to the show, how can somebody make sure that they're getting the right numbers when they're analyzing that deal? So I run my numbers based on is the mortgage, would it be able to be covered by a typical rental income without adding value? So if the house will rent, let's say the mortgage is going to be a thousand bucks as is, and can I, is this an area where I can rent for 12, 13, 1400 bucks, make a hundred bucks a door. And if I can do that, then it's probably going to be a good deal knowing that I can still add that downstairs extra cash flow. So, I mean, we're looking closer to, to like eight, $900 in cash flow per house if I can add that downstairs. And we only purchase properties if I can add that downstairs. But at minimum, the house has to be able to what we call standalone, meaning without adding any value to it right off picking it up. Will it cover the mortgage? Is it in an area that'll rent for, you know, the amounts of what the mortgage is going to be? That's what I would, t- that's what I would tell your listeners. Like, you know, before you buy a property, make sure that as is, will it rent and cover the mortgage and an extra hundred or 200 bucks, whatever your goal is before you even start adding value to it. So is this the only type of property that you're purchasing right now? A hundred percent. That's the only thing we buy. Do you have any plans to go into the multifamily space? So personally, I guess technically I am in the multifamily space. Like I create a single family home into a two separate living you know, dwellings. So I guess technically it is a multifamily, if you will. But I think personally, I'm going to continue doing the way I'm doing it, adding value. Because for me, it's harder to add value to a multifamily. And I like the strategy that I use. I don't think there's anything wrong with multifamily. I just think it doesn't fit my portfolio. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's really good that you've been very clear on what you want. A lot of people talk about focus and it sounds like you're very focused. You know exactly what you want. You know exactly how you're going to do it. And you just basically turn off the blinders for everything else. You don't get stuck on the shiny objects and you just go after what you know and and get to you to execute on that. You said you're making them two separate units? Technically. So we can rent the upstairs and the downstairs separately to two different families. Do they share any common area? has its own bathroom and, and kitchen and the downstairs is the same. Gotcha. So I thought originally that it was just making a three bedroom into say a four bedroom or a five bedroom and adding a second bathroom. No, no. We're adding a small kitchen and bathroom downstairs and there's already a small kitchen and bathroom upstairs. So it's two separate living areas. So for a brand new investor who's listening to the show today, who's yet to do their first deal, what strategy do you recommend for them? Do you think maybe a house hack or should they do something like what you're talking about doing today? 100%. I think they should start with a house hack. Buy a house with as low as money down as you can. Move in, rent out the other bedrooms to your buddies, and just start getting that knowledge of what it's like to be a landlord, what it's like to have to take problems at two in the morning. Just kind of start getting your feet wet with a house hack. I think is one of the safest, most cost-effective ways to do it. Start out, and then that's really going to get your feet wet. It's really going to start. And from there, you're going to be able to grow or continue using that same method. It's a really easy way to get into real estate, I think. It's really easy and you can do it with three and a half to 5% down, which is usually makes it a lot more affordable. And you only have to live there for a year. So if you want to turn it into a rental, you can move out after a year. And now you have a traditional rental that you only had to put 5% or less down on and you can continue operating it like that. Exactly. I think a house hack is like being, you know, investing in real estate with training wheels. Really hard to mess it up. Right. And then you get to take the training wheels off and then it's, I mean, it's, it's fantastic from there. I'm actually... I've done one house hack, one live and flip, and I'm about to do another house hack right now. I'm looking for... I just walked a three unit yesterday considering doing that. I don't necessarily want to live there, but I'm going to live there for a year, kind of just suck it up. And then... Because then the numbers are great once I move out as a, as a traditional rental. So it's something that a lot of people can do. And if you're not even willing to do that, you can buy a property, live in it for a year, and then rent it out afterwards. You can you could still get that 5% down. If maybe you have a family and you don't want a house hack and have people live with you, you could still go that strategy as well. Yep, that's right. I mean, it's like I said, it's it's a way to get into real estate with training wheels. 
for those that don't want, you know, a bunch of hiccups or, or to risk it all, if you will. I think what you're doing is great. And I think you're going to be very successful at it as you continue to grow your portfolio. From talking to all the different people that you talk to in the real estate space, whether it's on social media, on your podcast, and even just doing deals yourself, what do you see as some of the biggest mistakes that new investors are making? I think not identifying their goal is their main mistake. Because I hear people say, oh, well, I'm going to buy a single family home and house hack it, and then I'm going to go buy a multifamily, and then I might do a flip here, and then look at this new shiny object, this wholesaling, I might try that as well. And then two or three years go by and they never did. And it's because they built three or four bridges that never really made it to its other side of the destination, right? So I think I think most people don't specifically identify their goal as to what they want out of real estate, which is why they hop around and do a bunch of different things. It's kind of like going to the gym and running on the treadmill for five minutes and then lifting weights for 20 minutes and then getting in the hot tub and then going swimming. You're actually not doing a lot. Better to focus on like one thing and make sure that you're hyper-focused on that. Be the best that you can at that. Have that system running itself and then jump into something else. So. For any newbie, completely new, you know, rookie investor, I would say focus on mastering one source of real estate before you jump to the next. How do you determine what that right piece of real estate is to focus on if you're new and you don't know necessarily where to start? So then I would take a step back from there and say, pick up books, real estate books, and figure out other people's mistakes. Because we, including myself, all love to write about our mistakes and how we can help other people avoid that. Simply by you know picking up books that other people have written. There's plenty of, of books in in the bigger pockets library, right? Where you can you know pick up a book from Brandon Turner or David Green or you know anybody that that's just like this is the mistake that I've made. Don't do this. Or hey, you know if you're if you're looking to you know do a, do the burst, these are the things that are going to come up, right? So at least you have a, a, a foresight of what might happen. And I think that's a great way to dig into some of the mentors that you wish you had or that you would that you follow. Get inside their head by reading the books that they that they've written. So I think that's a great way to do it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ways to find a mentor is, you know, I get asked all the time, how do I find a mentor? How do I find a mentor? And I always tell people is having a one-on-one mentor is great, of course, but there's a lot of people that you can be mentored by that you don't necessarily have to have one-on-one access to via their books, their podcasts, things like that. I mean, there are guys that I wish I could be mentored by and I'm never going to have the chance to. So I go through and I just listen to their podcasts and that's their way of essentially mentoring me. So I think that that's great advice. But how does someone know when to stop focusing on something? If, if they decide to focus on something and it's going okay, but they're not sure if it's really what they want to do, how do they decide, or they're not good at it, how do they decide when is enough and now to try something else? So I think that comes at a point when you're not happy anymore. Once you're not passionate and once you're not happy with a certain objective that you're trying to reach, then it's probably time to pivot. For example, I've had many sleepless nights with real estate. As weird as that sounds, I'm still happy with what I do. So that tells me that I'm I'm not going to quit anytime soon. Now, I would tell someone that's in real estate, and let's say that they started flipping a house and, you know, they get to a point where they're just unhappy. They hate it. They're just, you know, mentally not in it anymore. Then it's probably time to pivot. Now, I'm not saying run when things get hard. I'm saying turn the other way when it's starting to take your joy. What mistakes have you made along the way of your real estate journey? Chasing money. I think that's been my biggest mistake when it comes to real estate. Instead of chasing a goal or chasing to make other people's lives better with real estate, I was chasing the money. And I think that's the biggest mistake that anyone can make. What exactly do you mean by that in real estate? What do you mean by chasing the money? So the difference between chasing your goal and chasing money is that money is going to look like a bunch of different things daily. So daily, you might be chasing a certain deal or a certain category or a certain style or a certain strategy in real estate. And you're never, like I said, you're never going to focus on one. But when you have a goal in mind of a certain real estate, now you're not chasing the money, you're chasing the goal. And that's, I think, smarter than just chasing the best deal or the best money I can find. If you if you see what other real estate professionals are doing, is they have a goal in mind. And I rarely see the word cash or money in that, right? They're looking for a certain close-up deal or a certain time frame, or a certain return even maybe. But they're not like, okay, I want, I want a million dollars and I'm going to chase a deal that gives me a million dollars. It's more about chasing your personal goal in real estate and buying properties that positively affect that versus, oh, this is a flip that's going to make me $10,000. And that has to be a good first strategy that's going to make me $20,000. And you know what? I can wholesale this deal for this amount. And then you just don't become the master at any of it. So that's what I mean by chasing the money. I would rather tell people, you know, chase your goal, you know, strategically chase that goal. And, and that's what's going to give you, you know, more satisfaction. But I don't think money brings satisfaction. I think reaching and crushing and obtaining goals is 
more satisfying than just the next money, if you will. When I hear that, I, I almost instantly think about flipping an Airbnb. And the reason for that is because a lot of people get into real estate for passive income. A lot of people want to get right. to financial independence. They want passive income. And so they do that, and, but then they go and flip or they do Airbnb and then they realize, well, neither of these are really super passive. They're actually pretty you know, hands-on for real estate. So they're going after the money. You know, They start with the goal of wanting freedom, financial freedom, and then they right. decide to start chasing the money because that's where it is and or it can be in Airbnb and flipping. Exactly. They lose track of their goal, which initially was probably not even the money or even passive income. If we're honest about it, I think most people's goal is to get their time back from their W-2 job or have that time freedom. Now, time freedom costs money. So I think that's when people lose it when they say, oh, well, I need to focus on the money. It's like, no, you need to focus on the time and then you know use money to get there, right? So that's why people start going for the burst. Or I'm sorry, that's why people start going for flipping properties or Airbnb that take up their time and they do end up with money but then they end up with less time and they're right back into a W-2 job, except now they just named it something else. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is they just swapped out the jobs. Rather than sitting at a corporate job, now you're just changing toilets and doing rehabs. It's, I mean, it's essentially exactly. the same thing, except exactly. now you're paying more taxes probably, more than anything. <laughs> yeah. You don't have health insurance and you, know, you don't have all the, all the cushy benefits of a, of a W-2. How are you able to balance working a job and it sounds like it was most likely your, your moving company, but how were you able to balance working a job and building your real estate portfolio? So at first it was really hard. And there is going to be those two or three years where you're still at your W-2 job, but also real estate investing. And there's like that transition period where you're like full-time investor versus leaving. So like I closed down my moving company now. So now I am just full-time real estate. But that last year was really, really hard. I think that's, I don't know uh, everyone, but I think that's a, a step that a lot of investors or newbie investors are going to take. That There's, there's going to be that one year where you're like going between your W-2 job and your real estate investing and taking that plunge into full-time real estate. And for me, it was about that year where it was like, okay, I have to, I have to get there. And that was probably the hardest year, having a full-time job and being full-time real estate. But once you take the plunge, it's, it, it's pretty nice. How do you know you were ready? What, what was the point that was like, I'm ready to, to go full time in real estate? So, you know, it's interesting. My wife is the one that told me I was ready. I probably would still be working both jobs, stretching my time real thin. But it was really my wife who was like, hey, I think we're ready. Like, you can, you can close down the moving company. Like, it's, we're good financially. And, you know, we're not going to have to make a lot of sacrifices. We're, we've set it up to where, you know, the rental income is pretty nice. She kind of had to talk me into it. I guess as a as the man of the house, and you know, I got a little guy as well. My son, you know, I was like, man, I don't know. I need as much coming in as possible to feed him and feed my wife and pay the bills and like all that. But it wasn't until I realized, like, you know what, you're right. If I can step out of this and be full time real estate and and make it worth it, so it's it's hard to let go. But once you do, it's it's definitely like a weight lifted off your shoulders, hundred percent. Learning from podcasts and all the information that we've talked about today, and even from books, I think is a great. Yep thing to do. And I think it's a vital part of success, but it's really only half the equation. I see the other half as the equation as being equally important, if not more important. And that's taking action on what you've actually learned. So after someone listens to this episode, what is the first thing they should go out and do to get started in their real estate business or to grow their already existing business? And I preach on this a lot and your listeners maybe get tired of hearing it. But honestly, if you don't have a identified goal personally that you can spit out the moment someone asks you in one, maybe two sentences, then I think you really might be going the wrong way or at least not going towards your goal as quick as possible. Yeah, you're going down the interstate at 70 miles an hour, but you might be going the wrong way. So I think more important than just taking action is taking action that's applicable to your goal. It's kind of like when people say knowledge is power. That sounds really nice, but I think applied knowledge is power. Because just having the knowledge doesn't do anything. So if you get all this real estate knowledge, you need to apply it towards your goal. And that's what's going to make you successful in real estate. Go out and take action and, and use the bottom line being your goal as to what action you're going to take date. Don't just take aimless action. Take you know pointed action towards your goal. Take directed action. Hey, I want $200 in cash flow per door. Okay, why don't you go analyze deals in an area? Where you like to invest and find out if that area works for you. Or let's say you're ready to invest. Have you been pre-approved? Do you have a good lender? Do you have a good realtor, right? Start creating your team. So those are the things that I would say. And then definitely go listen to the Real Estate Rookie Show. I think that's going to help a lot. Of yeah, definitely. And I love what you said about the applied knowledge because I fell in that camp where I 
kind of had a, a lot of knowledge, but I didn't do anything with it. So it was more or less a, right. a waste. And I tell this story on the podcast, but I've read, I, it was two years in a row where I read almost 60 or 70 books in a year, but I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything about it. I didn't put into action anything I learned. So yeah, maybe I had a lot of information in my head. Maybe I knew a lot, but it's useless if you don't do anything about it. So I, I really love what you said about, about the applied knowledge. And I think it's important to have the right goals and, and work on that. How does somebody define that right goal for them? How do they know? How do they go about even finding that if somebody isn't sure what they want? Good question. Man, that's a hard one because if, if you don't know what you want, I wouldn't start investing in real estate. I can tell you that. I would first work on identifying my personal goal and then investing in real estate. Because if you just start taking action, you have the possibility that you're taking action in the wrong direction. That, and that's what happened with my six unit apartment complex. You know, I went and bought the first cash flowing property that made more than a thousand bucks that I could find, but it didn't meet my goal of time freedom. It was just another job. So I bought a property for the money and not for the goal. So for those who don't know what they want, go pick up a book or even go interview or talk to people that are maybe where you want to be and just ask them, you know, hey, what were your goals growing up? What did you do to get where you're going? If I want to be the best basketball player in the world, you know, I'm going to go talk to or read the book by Michael Jordan or LeBron James or, you know, things like that. So find a mentor that is where you want to be and just start reading on them. And if you can talk to them, figure out what their goals were and maybe you can get close to or identical goals as them to reach that place. Yeah, I think it's really important to get your goals clearly defined before you start working towards things. And I learned this because I thought going into college that I wanted to work a specific job. I had the job title. I knew what I wanted to do. And I thought because I never asked anyone that I knew the major I needed to get that job. And I was about two years through school. And it turns out that I was in the wrong major to get the job that I wanted. And that was completely on my own fault. I, I assumed that I knew what I wanted because I knew what my end goal was, but I didn't know how to actually get there. So you know, you need to define those things and then find out actually what it takes to get there. I think a lot of people have goals, but they don't know how to get there. And they think that it goes a certain way. And when you actually learn about what it actually takes, it's very different than what you expect. For anyone that wants to connect with you further, we talked about it briefly, but tell us a little bit more about where they can go to find you. You can hear my voice on the Real Estate Rookie Show with Bigger Pockets. You can find me on Instagram at Felipe Mejia, R E I. That's F E L I P E M E J I A R E I. And uh, that's basically where you can find me, man. I'll be sure to put links to everything that we talked about throughout the show, as well as all the different ways that you can connect with him in the show notes. You guys could go do that. Felipe, thanks so much. Always a pleasure, man. Thanks so much for having me. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Millennial Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.